one of my big realizations that kind of led to uh, some sort of survivor's remorse for me is the understanding that if I wasn't privileged enough to leave Nigeria when I did, that I might very well be a scammer. Okay guys, so this, this is gonna be an interesting video. Um, there's some things that I want to go into and I'm, I'm gonna talk about them on a very superficial level and um, hopefully I can find good examples of people who can go more in depth than I can. Um, and as you can see from the title, it's, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a mental roller coaster. So, as, as a Nigerian living in America, as a Nigerian who migrated to America, um, one of the things that I've noticed um, is the same disdain and look down on that you know black Americans accuse white Americans of in the system of oppression and, and racism is very eerily similar to the same disdain that well-to-do Nigerians um, look at lowly lower class Nigerians. Um, so the way the people on the islands and the rich people on the mainland look at the vast majority of their fellow Nigerians. And consequently, the way America, I mean, Nigerians who've made it out of Nigeria and done relatively well for themselves look at Nigerians back home who didn't have that opportunity. And consequently didn't do so well for themselves. So as a Nigerian, one of the stereotypes is we're scammers, you know, um, our women are promiscuous. You know, you look at what happens in Italy, for example, with human trafficking, a large number of those women are Nigerian women who migrated there through the Sahara to try to find a better life for their families and ended up in prostitution. Um, now, the part of this that I think a lot of us miss is that we're not as great people as we think we are. And given certain circumstances, we would make decisions that our current self would look down on. A good place to start with this is what's called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So for those of you guys who don't know Maslow, was, uh, I believe, a developmental psychologist. <clears throat> and he came up with a pyramid. And the way that it goes is, as a human being, you have needs. And these needs build on each other. At the foundation of that is physiological needs. So physiological needs would be food, water. You know, you need to sleep. Um, things for physical sustenance. And then once that's met, you move up to the next level, which is safety needs. So safety could be shelter, literally having a roof over your head. Safety could be work, having a steady stream of income. Safety could be, um, you know, being in an area where you do not feel threatened. Once that's met, <clears throat> you move up to the next level. The next level, is love and belonging. So as human beings, we know we're social creatures. Um, so love and belonging would be, you want community. You want love. Whether it's platonic love or romantic love, you want partnership, you want group dynamics. And then once that's met, you move up to esteem. So esteem is that need to achieve something. You wanna get that degree. You wanna land that job. You wanna win that award. You wanna um, win that competition. Once that's met, you move up to what's called self-actualization. So self-actualization would be, you know, like the people on Instagram call your best self, your enlightened self, your higher self. Now, what's interesting about that is a lot of times when we critique people, 
for not operating as their best selves. We dismiss or completely um, disregard the fact that they might not have even eaten that day. Now, what's interesting about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is education majors usually learn this, and it's a way for them to rationalize and empathize with the students that they might be teaching. So understanding that Timmy isn't going to be as receptive to learning algebra today if he didn't eat breakfast, or if he's coming from a home situation that's broken, that feels unsafe, if he has low self-esteem and things like that. And I think it's an important concept to really look at when it comes to human beings and when it comes to how you think about yourself and how you consider others as well. Consider the fact that some people are not even allowed the opportunity to move up the hierarchy to become and operate as their best selves. We talk about scarcity mindset versus abundance mindset. If you look at the pyramid, scarcity mindset exists on those lower levels. It's, it's that doggy dog, there's not enough to go around mentality. And then on the higher levels, that's when you get to abundance mindset. There's enough for everybody. What can I do to help type of mindset? But it is literally impossible, according to this, to achieve an abundance mindset on an empty stomach. To, you know, some, um, I believe David Banner said, we ask black kids to dream big, dream big dreams, without realizing that they don't have beds. We ask black people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps uh, without realizing they don't have boots. So I think it's important that we realize that and operate in a way to, if we're helping people to repair them on a hierarchical basis and repair ourselves on a hierarchical basis. Now, one of the things that has been interesting for me is I've found a link between Maslow's hierarchy of needs and brain waves. So according to um, brain scientists, neurologists, um, there are five types of brain waves. <clears throat> and again, these brain waves, similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these brain waves build on themselves. So people layer them differently, but I'll layer them in this way. So beta waves, beta waves are the waves that you, your brain experiences during wakefulness. So it's, it's everyday activity when you're in class, when you're learning stuff, when you're just moving through the world. So when you're in a beta state, you're more aware of the outside versus the inside. And the frequency of those waves is low. I mean, I'm sorry, it's high. It's high frequency, meaning that it's boom, 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 as you can see. Um, and then after that, you move into alpha. So alpha frequency uh, is lower, which means that the waves are spread further apart and they're bigger. And an example of an alpha state would be when you're physically and mentally relaxed. So you start looking at meditation. You start looking at the time between laying down and going to sleep when you're just relaxed. And to elaborate on that, you get into the theta state. So again, the waves are spreading out and becoming bigger. And that is when you are at your most creative. So that is, for example, lucid dreaming. So that's when you can dream and if you want to fly, you fly, you know. But it is kind of the bridge between physical sleep and mental wakefulness. And then from there, you get into a delta state. So a delta state would be that deep sleep, that REM sleep, where your body and your mind are essentially unaware. So it's, it's subconscious. Now what's interesting is when individuals master themselves, so we're, we're talking about monks, high level thinkers, they get into gamma. 
Now, you would assume that gamma, the wave uh, frequency would be lower, so, you know, bigger waves further apart. But it's actually smaller. The, the waves are smaller together, and the wave frequency is higher. And some people actually call it super consciousness. So, for example, a monk can imagine eating an apple, and if you hooked up brain receptor, uh, brain machine to them, the same places that would fire if they were actually eating an apple will fire. So that's when you talk about manifestation. That's when you talk about your inner self is completely in control and you're observing the physical world as a spectator. So that's where we talk about wokeness. Like that's true wokeness. That's that gamma frequency. Now, again, I'm not going to go too in depth because I'm not an expert, but it's interesting how when we're talking about moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then moving up brain frequencies, it's interesting how that happens. Now, they did a study and they actually found that stress reduces your IQ by seven points or one standard deviation. So to put it plainly, when you are stressed, when you're in a scarcity mindset, you are objectively dumber. We've gone from psychological and then we're going to go spiritual. So, you know, again, I'm not an expert on these things, just a high level um, observer of them and appreciator of them. Um, we talk about, you know, woke people when they bring up the third eye, kundalini, um, chakras and all that stuff. I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing, again, to juxtapose to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and brainwaves because they're eerily similar. So, for example, the idea of the chakras is that we have seven chakras and, and all the chakra is, is imagine like a energy intersection in your, in your body. So you'll see the picture of the person meditating and they've got little orbs from it looks like their butthole all the way up to the top of their head. And the one in their butthole, <laughs> the one close to their bottom is the root chakra. And then the one at the very top is the crown chakra. And then you have chakras in the middle. So to go down the list, the root chakra is the chakra of groundedness. It's the here chakra. The sacral chakra is the chakra associated with your reproductive organs. So um, that's the sexual trauma. It's also in charge of creativity, which is interesting because when we talk about life creating, ideas, creativity. Then from there in your stomach, that is a solar plexus chakra. So a lot of people, spiritual people and even intellectuals call your, your gut your second brain. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, and it's, it's very interesting. You know, sometimes when you're angry or when you're stressed or when you um, experience trauma, you'll almost feel like you're swallowing it. And according to mystics, that's, li that's a literal swallowing of despair and storing it in your solar plexus chakra. Um, and then your heart chakra, obviously, you know, um, your heart is also connected. Your heart is literally your engine. It's what's pumping blood throughout your body. And then from there, your throat chakra, it's, it governs, you know, what you say um, or what you don't say. Um, it governs, you know, um, how your thoughts manifest verbally. And then from there, your third eye chakra. So that's the woke people, the the middle eyeball that's connected to your pineal gland and it allows you to see things that most people can't see with the naked eye. And then from there, your crown chakra. So your crown chakra, according to this whole thing, is where you connect to the divine. So hypothetically, according to this, the divine God, the universe, whatever you believe in, sends you energy through your crown chakra and it then filters through the other, you know, six and then goes around. So it's almost a cycle. And 
if there are any defects at any of those intersections, then you will manifest problems. Um, so for example, if you have throat problems, it might be an issue with your throat chakra. Stomach problems might be an issue with your solar plexus chakra. And again, juxtaposing this with the other two concepts we've talked about, the higher self or the gamma self or the self-actualized self operates on those pineal crown levels. Um, but a lot of times, if we haven't satisfied those, uh, those other areas, or if there are blockages in any of those other um, four or three chakras that we talked about on the way to the top two, um, it, it, it impairs us from achieving the best that we could potentially achieve. So what does this mean for you? So first and foremost, um, I believe that a problem that's identified is half solved. And a lot of times when we talk about our issues, we talk about our problems, we talk about our connection to the universe, our connection to the greater whatever, um, we usually dialogue with that from a stance of being lost. And it impairs how we can understand ourselves and consequently how we can understand others. I might very well be sending you emails saying, I'm a prince, if you send me $20 or $100, I'll flip it to whatever. And on that level, I can then dialogue with those people because I'm not an other. I am them. I was just privileged enough to be given a better garden to grow in. And if we can create better gardens, I think we'd be surprised with the type of flowers that will bloom. You know, one thing that Tupac said is that his acronym Thug Life was um, actually something that meant the hate you give little infants fucks everybody. <laughs>